Okay. So we are recording, and for those who are watching this session much later, this is the session about the intersection of sustainability and ethics in business. To help us have that discussion, we're going to have a speaker, Benedict Kariuki. He's phenomenal. He's had great experience in so many fields that are relevant, starting from HR back in the days and all the way progressing to strategy. Now we'll be hearing about how that came together and the value that you can expect from him when it comes to building your business, especially in the areas of sustainability and also balancing that with ethics. It's not the same. And we're going to learn a bit about that and how that can be applied in our businesses. Okay, my name again is Sam Chimera and I will continue to be your moderator for these sessions. But before we get too far down, I'm going to share with you the agenda for the day. Okay, let me just give me a moment and I'll share that with you. Uh, here we go, here we go, here we go. Just bear with me. Let me share with you my screen once again. Wait, once. Okay, good. Just bear with me clicking two times. There we go. So the agenda for today is going to be very simple. We're going to have a welcome note from uh, Peter Dumia, who is our uh, sort of like our favorite co person for these sessions. And we definitely appreciate him being here uh, amongst many other people. Um, we'll have a fireside chat with uh, our guest speaker, just letting us know. We'll have a presentation and then we can ask questions after. And then after that, we'll be hearing maybe a little bit from uh, the top side. Okay. At the end, we'll have a call to action. And of course, we'll wrap up. This session happens between 11 and 12.30 every week. And it's been going for close to a year now. So there's lots of sessions. If you're just coming in now, we are wondering where you've been, but we're so excited to have you here. As a matter of fact, before we get into our welcome note, I want to take note of those who are here for the very first time. If you're here for the very, very, very first time, or maybe first or second time, please type one or two in the chat. Type one or two in the chat. That way we can identify you. Samuel, good to see you. Samuel Weir is here for the first time. Welcome. Anyone else? Uh, we have Samuel Karanja. We have Juanika. This is amazing. Where have you been, guys? Paul Muganda, Mark Kirave, um, anyone else? Maybe even second time. So you're here for the first or second time. It's still like those first couple of times. Stephen Akello, welcome, welcome, welcome. Guys, those of you who are, so we have like 50 plus people who are here and about 10 of us, I guess, are here for the first time. Christine, I see you. <laughs> Dr. Irungo has been here for one million times. <laughs> So that's exciting as well. Susan is here for the second time. So let me do me a favor. For those who have been here many times and you're constant members of our community, please do me a favor and give, uh, give an applause to those who are here for the first time. Use your emojis, give a thumbs up, give a smile, give a clap, whatever you can find. Guys, this is for you. Welcome, welcome. This is the place to be. Every Thursday, 11 to 12.30, this is the place to be. We come in with all our energy, we're excited, we're entrepreneurs, we come in, we're ready to learn, we have great speakers, and we also get to hear from our bank and figure out what they can help us with in our journey. So what better place to be on a Thursday morning? So super excited to be here, and thank you so much for joining us today. Again, I'll be letting you know about the link. So we'll be sharing a link for all the sessions we've had in the past. But for now, I want to hand over to uh, Peter and Demir just to give us a welcome note and to especially make those who are here for the first time feel welcome. Peter, good to see you, sir. Good to see you, Sam, back with a lot of energy. Welcome, I think you also needed to welcome you back. Yes, 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 I missed the last two weeks. <laughs> yes, yes, and uh, yeah. participants kept on asking when, when you'll be back. I'm, I'm sure we are excited to see you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. And, and Fiona did a great job. You did a uh, good handover notes. Ah, you, ah, man, Fiona is threatening. You know how you're like, ah, I need to keep my job. But Fiona, I think, is uh, at this rate, they may say, ah, you know what? Ah, ah Sam, thank you, but uh, Fiona is better at this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Fiona is coming up very, very well. And uh, we, of, course, of course, we really, we really missed you. And uh, we you. Really appreciate the good, the good work that you're also doing out there. We saw you uh, out there. I mean, uh, doing a lot of uh, support to the MSMEs. As well. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, Peter, please welcome our first time guests and also let them know what this thing is about. Where have I been? You know, what what all the exciting things happening with Top Bank. Good. And then we'll get yeah. into our session. 
Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, and um, our dear customers and the participants in this session. Uh, good morning and welcome to the session. We are glad to see you. We are super, super excited to see all of you uh, in the session with a lot of energy, a lot of interactions, and particularly to the new uh, attendees for the session. We really appreciate we have seen a number of you have joined for the first time. Where have you been? Uh, you see uh, Susan. Samuel, Wanika, Paul, Mark, and many, many others who are joining for the first session. This is where we meet uh, every Thursday, uh, CoBank MSME webinar for the uh, support of our MSMEs and the entrepreneurs with, with skills. And this is uh, what we call a webinar that happens as part of the non-financial services uh, program that is at our business banking department. Just make sure that we add value your businesses. So uh, in addition to the MSMB webinars is what we do, the networking forums, we do the MSME clinics uh, across the network where our branches also support you with skills. And we also do what we call the international business uh, trips. And of course, we have these recordings uh, in our website or in our MSME uh, online portal. So I think the trip is happening uh, next week on Thursday, on Friday, uh, up to 3rd of October, and we are glad uh, to say that we have very, very good numbers, and we hope that we learn as well, and we'll expose a number of us out there uh, in Malaysia and Vietnam. So thank you so much. Uh, I, yes, yes, I see Fiona has shared the details. Yes, that is where we'll be. We'll be. And next week, we'll be traveling on Friday, and we hope that we'll be back on that of October. This is just to support our business customers to meet with suppliers uh, out there and also to get uh, exposed to some of these uh, other markets that possibly would add value uh, to their businesses. So thank you so much for coming in. I hope that we'll continue to learn. We have been doing this uh, the whole of this year and last year. We have had very, very good speakers, very good sessions just to add value, we've talked about bookkeeping, we have done a lot of things on marketing, um, issues to do with, with uh, ethics, and many, many other topics. And today we are also here uh, again to learn and we have a very good speaker, Benedict, to share some of the insights that we are looking forward to uh, when it comes to sustainability and ethics. Uh, so for us as a bank, it's really to welcome you uh, in this session, hoping that you'll also be attending in the future, uh, in the future events. And we hope that we're also enjoying some of the products or the solutions that we have in our branches that will be helping you to continue to grow uh, your business. So the agenda here is to make sure that we have both the financial solutions and the non-financial solutions. Uh, Karibu Nisana, and uh, heading over back to Sam, and I also see Christine saying that this is her birthday. Happy birthday to you, Christine. Ah. Thank you. Over back to you, Sam. Happy birthday. Yes, Christine. Well, I think we need to sing for Christine. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Christine. Happy birthday to you. Excellent. <laughs> please say, please say happy birthday. Yes, yes, yes. There's a family here, so we're keen to celebrate you. We are not going to ask how old are you. <laughs> Lots of happy birthday coming through. So now some of you are saying happy birthday. Ah, you say happy birthday. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Peter. <laughs> All right. Um, let's move forward in our in our flow. Um, let me tell you. So Peter has uh, covered quite a bit about co banks. So for those who didn't have the context, and want to say thank you, Peter. Peter, the rest of us who missed out on this trip, I thought we'd make the announcement, but I was reliably informed that uh, you guys filled up the plane. So and you know the plane is not like a matat where you can squeeze in someone extra there. So. Uh, the rest of us, I guess, are going to have to wait for next yes. year. <laughs> but thank you for putting this together. And we're looking forward to hearing all the good things that come through from this trip. Thank you. All right. All right. Let's take a moment and appreciate Peter. Thank you for the work that you're doing. 
And as that happens, I will tell you, especially for those who are here for the first or second time, let me share with you a little bit about AMI and what we're doing. So AMI is African Management Institute. And this particular session is brought to you by Corp Bank. It's a collaboration between Corp Bank and AMI. So AMI is all about enabling ambitious businesses and entrepreneurs such as yourselves across Africa to thrive. So we love to do that using the digital spaces. So in that way, we've reached about uh, 39 countries across Africa. Thousands of people trained, about 42,000 trained, I think, plus. We also have content in uh, Arabic. Is it Arabic? Uh, so English, French, Swahili, Kenya, Rwanda. And I believe it's Arabic, but I need to confirm. But all to make sure that we're reaching as many SMEs as possible. So we are keen to even improve that as we go. Lots of practical tools online and also courses online. So. We offer that training for managerial type training to also SMEs and providing them the tools that they need. So when this opportunity came up to, to j jump onto this uh, collaboration effort with uh, with the uh, Bank, hey, we're excited and uh, we're here. So we are super excited that you're here as well. Now, without any further ado, I want to get into our meet for the day. So we have a speaker. His name is Benedict Kariuki. Is the founder and the strategy consultant, aka advisory. Ah, uh, Benedict, I wanted to do like a proper introduction so that when you switch on your video, people say, Ella, wait, this is the man. We are not worthy to be on this session, sir. <laughs> so, so since you're here, it's okay. You stay here. But I wanted to, to read up a bit on some of the work that you've been doing because I was when I was reading up, I was really excited about some of the work you've been doing. Um, so I'll take a moment and do that introduction and put this picture up here so that they know the man himself is here. So Benedict has been, uh, let me start from the problems he solves. So there's something he and his team uh, came together with. They recognized a gap for especially SMEs. They recognize that SMEs especially deal with four particular challenges. One, they want to increase their sales. They want to get access to finance and affordable access to finance. That's a key one. They wanted to, uh, they know that SMEs struggle to build teams. And they also know that SMEs sometimes struggle to create organizational impact. So he and his team at AK Strategy and Consultancy, they decided to solve these problems and this is how they solve those problems and afterwards i'm going to ask him how exactly it came together so we are looking at customized interventions in fact why don't i just leave it with you to, to do since you already jumped here i was very keen on so you do customized interventions for every client that you work with what does the customized intervention look like what kind of solutions are you providing please elaborate for us and then i'll get into the rest that i was reading about penalty Thank you very much, uh, Sam. I think when I grow up, I just want to be like an MC moderator. <laughs> like you, like for you, it flows naturally. You should be on the radio, media everywhere. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm honored by your your introduction. In fact, I'm questioning yes. myself. Do I look like that? <laughs> See, I, yes. but I've, I've just done only half of the introduction. Now you we wait till you hear the next part. <laughs> yes. Uh, so when we talk about customized, is uh, every person who runs a business, they have got a way they see their business, and it cannot be the same with another entrepreneur. Even if you are in the same type of the business, your outlook is very, very, very different. How you see things, uh, your mindset is very different. We work with your mindset. Some of them have to be improved or changed, but how you perceive your business is very different uh, from the other. And that's why if you are developing something like a strategy, is you cannot copy another person's strategy because when they developed it, they had their own view, which is not yours. Yeah, so that's what we mean by customized. So I know you do business strategy development, there's financial management, there's business finance linking, there's business coaching. And also, I'm very curious to hear, how did you come from HR, because that was sort of like a few, quite a number of years back. HR into strategy. How did how did that come together? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think for me it was uh, moving from uh, I was in HR, which was very exciting for uh, for me. I worked there for over ten years, and what I came to understand is uh, one of the most important thing about businesses is how do they respond to circumstances. Because uh, there is something you need to respond to because there is an opportunity ahead of you. The trip to Vietnam, which I saw Peter advertising there, that is an opportunity. How do you respond 
to it. But also you are trying to respond to that opportunity. There are also some challenges. Challenges like uh, right now there are a lot of challenges facing business from taxation, uh, uh, from taxation to rising cost of living. How you respond to them is strategy. Basically, that's how strategy is. And for me, it was uh, just a just a, a, an interest which I developed, and I became so much interested with the strategy and how can it be adopted even for smaller businesses. So sometimes strategy appears as if it's for larger companies, but also how you are responding to opportunities and challenges. It is your strategy. Even when you wake up in the morning and you heard there was a traffic, like there's going to be a, a traffic slander because either there are presidents coming into the country and how you plan your day, that is your strategy. So all the time you are thinking about strategy, about how you are going to achieve what you want. And strategy is all about, are you going to be here tomorrow? That's it. Fantastic. Well, Benedict is here. He's going to be walking us through our theme for the day, but I just had to mention... Benedict and his team at AK Advisory have worked with over 500 semis and they've helped them to scale and grow in their revenue. And maybe the last thing I'll ask you before you get into your, your, your presentation about um, ethics and sustainability, especially in business, um, just what kind of sectors have you worked with? Because I know here we have almost 100 people across different sectors, maybe. I know you. there's Agri, just speak a bit about that so that perhaps they also get the, even the extra confidence that ah this gentleman is speaking to me what what kind of sectors have those been okay i've worked in sectors especially in agriculture the from primary to secondary processing we also worked with services especially education sector retail uh, people do, uh, people in uh, retail uh, retail services non-profit also uh, non-profit organizations will uh, also uh, work with them and then also organizations which provide professional uh, services we also have worked with clients in uh, building and construction the uh, industry and also manufacturing and also we have worked with the uh, clients also in it Either those ones who are already established or those ones who are at a, a startup stage. That's why you see a lot of aspects of uh, we help people source for capital. Uh, for capital, especially for startup, if you are starting up and if you're in the middle, you are looking to expand, uh, expand uh, into it. One of the things I found out, like principles of businesses run in all the, the, the sectors. Yes. And finally, also I've worked with the government, uh, with the government uh, in one project, which I'll probably mention to, uh, uh, it in the course of my presentation. Fantastic. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have our founder and strategy consultant, AK Advisory, Benedict Karyuki. Please give the close at this point. And as I transition, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to allow him to share his screen. He's going to give us a presentation on our topic today, the intersection of sustainability and ethics in business. What does that mean? What does that mean for you? What does it look like? How will it affect your impact as you plan? And we're going to have that conversation for about 20 minutes, 20 or 25 minutes, the presentation. And after that, we'll get into a conversation where you can also ask your questions and we can respond as well. So at this point, I'll be off. If you have a question at any point, we have a Q&A section. We have a chat section. Please type it in there so you don't forget. And then we will come to it at the end of Benedict's uh, 20 or 25 minutes. Benedict, thank you so much for being here. I'm going to hand it over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Sam. Uh, Sam. So I was given this uh, task of uh, just trying to come up with the intersection. Where, where is the intersection of sustainability and ethics uh, in business? Uh, that's what I'm going to deal with uh, in this presentation. For the 95, 96 people who are in this presentation, basically these are things you always heard about. Like uh, it is not something which you are hearing it for from the first time. So in my presentation, I'm just going to send uh, to just share with you some of the frameworks which might send you into thinking. Frameworks are the same things we have worked with from the time when we were in high school, uh, in high school or primary school, is we're introduced to formulas in mathematics. And those formulas have applied, whether it is the area of a triangle or area of a circle or circumference of a circle. Frameworks and models actually help us to bring the complexity of a matter and actually synthesize it to a simple thing, such that when you go to apply using a model, it is more applicable. So I'm going to share with you some models which afterwards now you can 
you can think about how you are going to implement especially the issue of sustainability and ethics in business so the first question is i want just to see on the chat is uh, why are you in business i like to see on the chat like uh, why are you in business i am assuming everyone here on this call is in business but i like to see your answers why are you in business So let me see if answers are coming. So I've seen a uh, Mbatia to make a living. Tom, uh, Tony uh, uh, provides solutions. Everyone should be here. Like we should have like uh, 80 or 80. Uh, have a wider impact, make a living, make money. Uh, Christine good to make money. Uh, who else? Uh, We've got only uh, Jojo Pro to make money, some enjoy a meaningful life, uh, Kenneth Kamau extra coin, uh, Peter Wawero to make profits, financial freedom, uh, Peter, and uh, let me check the last three. Uh, Dennis gainfully employed, uh, Wanyika, uh, impact the society, Christine Miriko prosperity and prosperity. So thank you very much. And most of, your answers are actually correct. Everyone in business, before everything else, you are in business for one simple thing, and that is to create wealth. That's it. Everything else you see people doing, helping around uh, corporate social responsibility, helping, much of it comes after they have created wealth. Uh, at AK, uh, AK Advisory, when we work with the clients, the question we are actually monitoring is, after we work with you, are you building your wealth? Are you building? Is your is your is your well is your net worth increasing? That is the most important part of a business. Is it increasing? Uh, is it uh, increasing? Are you on the path of increasing it? And after some time, it must be tangible. Wealth is tangible. It's not something which can be assumed. Like I can claim I'm increasing wealth, and there is nothing to show about it. It has to be shown. So this is the most important part uh, in business, and it will be very good background to consider as we talk about these aspects of sustainability and ethics. So, very quickly is uh, very quickly uh, very quickly is sustainable uh, sustainability and ethics usually comes to two things. One sustainability is there are things which the company wants to do. Uh, like uh, from the, the what have I actually put in this PowerPoint is like there are some responsibilities which the company wants to do as it is delivering its business. Like it wants to think about uh, how can we reduce any negative environmental impact. And what is the long-term viability of our operations? But as it's doing like that, it needs to think about what is the moral principle uh, behind our decision making and how we behave. So there are these two aspects of uh, sustainability and ethics. And what I also want you to consider is this: that I want you to see sustainability and ethics as a competitive edge that can be nurtured. Whatever business you are, if you take these things and you nurture them, it can be a competitive edges. Businesses not only compete on the revenues, but the other competitive uh, edges. I think you've heard of companies which pay people very well, but people don't want to work with them. And then there are some two companies you might meet out there, like they don't pay people very highly, but almost everyone wants to work with them. The aspect of sustainability and ethics uh, in any business or any organization can be nurtured as a competitive uh, edge. So today in this session is we are going to ask ourselves in this intersection of sustainability, are these two things uh, able to be the same? Is there room for sustainability and ethics in the decisions that businesses make? And towards this is, uh, I'll start by this unfortunate picture you are seeing here. This is something which happened in Kenya uh, some time back. Uh, some time back, uh, I think right now we're almost in the sixth year or something. So this is what happened. Exactly. It, uh, this is about the solar dam. This is what happened in, uh, I think, if you can remember back in 2018, there was a tragedy which happened in the uh, Rift Valley, which we've never seen in these countries. I think right now it's when we are seeing dam bursting in, uh, I think, in Libya. But in Kenya, we were we had it in uh, 2018. And, the, and 
it's an ongoing case. First of all, there was a lot of time trying to find out if there is a case to answer. And actually now the case which is in court is, uh, which a lot of people have been asking uh, here, was it an act of God? The company has been claiming it has been an act of God, but now the ruling which I think was made this year was like, people responsible for construction of that dam have a case uh, to answer. Uh, have a case to answer and these are some of the cases which we usually face as people in businesses sometimes it can be come as a form of a tragedy but sometimes it's how does your behavior come of it i think out of this tragedy a lot of things came about these companies like they really did not have a very good relationship with the people around there people used to see them see uh, their large farm things coming in things moving out but there was no relation so today in this talk uh, I'm going to try and uh, just see how can your business prepare in advance. The thing about ethics is you make a decisions in advance so that when something happens, it's not the time you keep thinking. You've already thought about it and you've already made an answer about it. Uh, about it. So it's things which you say, this I'll not partake or this one does not uh, run according to my principle and I'll not do it. That is a decision you make in advance. So, can a company actually minimize its carbon footprint, uh, footprint, uh, footprint its emission while conserving the environment? While and is there an ethical principle that should guide such uh, an activity, such a decision which the company is looking at? So, as you can see from this, the first intersection which comes uh, on these two aspects of uh, sustainability, especially sustainability, has to do a lot with the environment. Is are we reducing the carbon footprint, this aspect of water conservation, minimizing waste and reducing or curbing noise pollution in some of the businesses? But now the ethical aspect and the most important thing about this is, are you respecting, are you observing the rights of the current generation, the future generation, uh, the value of preserving natural, uh, uh, the, I do, uh, are you doing this from the value of preserving the natural environment? So the principle, uh, the framework which I'm going to use here, I think you've heard of it in the ESG uh, framework. And as you can see from the from the photo over there, is you can see it's divided into three parts. So whatever aspects I'm going to take you to uh, in this uh, conversation, you're going to see these things in these three aspects uh, of environment or social. For small and medium enterprises which form part of uh, this audience, much of these things will deal with how do you treat your employees. Your first thing is your employees and then your customers. You cannot treat your customer. How you treat how you relate to your customers is very much influenced with how you relate, you treat your employees. So your employees come first. Uh, come first in this, and there'll be a lot of talk uh, about this. So these are some of the stakeholders which you have it. Whether you know it or not, these are some of the stakeholders you have. Uh, this 15, there might be others which I'm going to look. So as we go through this uh, presentation, I also want you to see like everything you're suggesting here has interaction with all these uh, stakeholders, uh, stakeholders uh, on it. Also, we shall be talking about all these critical matters and much of it, apart from the last one of animal welfare, relate to people. Like do observe labor rights, what are the working conditions where is there ethnic diversity in your place? Is there gender equality? The huge, huge problems in SMEs, especially the aspect of gender equality. I've faced a lot of uh, countries, I've faced a lot of clients who they don't want to employ women, simply, especially young ones, simply they consider this as a cost should they get pregnant. These are critical matters. And for me, even there's some very many clients I've refused to work with them, I've told them. That cannot be your basis of not employing people. That is an aspect which uh, SMEs, a lot of SMEs, especially when they are hiring, they don't want to work with younger women. They ask this question in the interview, which sometimes are a little bit intrusive. Do you have a family? Do you intend to get a family? They are a little bit intrusive. But as a business, this is something you should, it should not be used as a basis of employing someone or denying someone an opportunity. Then there is also the equal pay for equal work. When you come to your organization, are men and men men and women paid equally for the work they are able to do? And then there are also other aspects of women rights, like in your organization, women and their special needs are they addressed? 
if you have got nursing mothers and their issues uh, addressed. And then in your supply chain or in your businesses or the other people interacting with your business, have you taken time to observe if there is an aspect of child, children, especially of child labor or any other exploitation that can be uh, happening? And then there is the issue of people living with disability. And then there is also a country like Kenya, which uh, hosts a lot of uh, refugees. If they are going to work in your organization, do you treat them the same way you treat the other citizens of this country? And then finally, animal welfare, especially people in agriculture or their uh, or their uh, or their their livelihoods deal with dealing with animals. Are those animals kept in the, in the proper condition? So the first aspect deals with actually transparency. Do you engage your stakeholders? Uh, first of all, regularly and then in a transparent manner. Does your business have a clear communication strategy? This is when I will start seeing, like there are some things you need to have uh, prepared as policy in advance. Uh, in advance, should a customer receive poor service, how do you respond to them there and then, and even afterwards? And even do you have a follow up mechanism afterwards to show like you are really concerned, like they did not get the service they required, and even if they got the service they required is follow up and see if you can improve. And then do you regularly share information, especially with your employees, what is happening in your company, uh, in your company. This one, apart from your employees, it goes to all the other stakeholders. There are two-way communications, like when you uh, when you communicate to people, you allow people to communicate back to you. Then is there use of plain language? This is a problem in this country uh, where... Okay, I'm seeing somebody saying yeah, Samuel Jora raised the hand. I don't know what that. Some. Uh, it's okay, it's okay. We can keep going. Okay, yeah. Then uh, there's the issue of also transparency in decision making. Any decisions made in the company are they made in a transparent manner? Like for example, when we had COVID nineteen and the companies had to let people off or they had to reduce pay. Did people in your organization, especially your employees, feel like the decision which was taken was done in a transparent manner? And then you disclose relevant metrics, like what revenue we made, or even are we paying taxes? Are we tax compliant as a company? Uh, as a company? And then also do report on social reporting. So this one, this aspect deals with the stakeholder management. It goes back to customer transparency. What are your relationship? Uh, what is your relationship with your company? Does it have transparency? Uh, transparency, especially when there is delays or shortages, or probably the quality of the product might be affected by one thing or another. Employee engagement is going to be in this uh, talk from the beginning and the end, because at a SME level, your supply chains are not complicated. Your footprint, probably your environmental footprint, is not as large as possible. But you have employees in your organization. Uh, how do you engage with them? And also, there is a community. Sara, which surrounds you, uh, which surrounds your company, uh, company. Do you engage them? Do you involve them? Do you feel they have got a use for your enterprise? Where you're going, and then also there's training and education, both for the employees, for your suppliers, and sometimes for your customers. And then do you demonstrate uh, accountability? You might be a private company; you don't need to make your things uh, public. But is there a way you can? Uh, you, have, you can demonstrate accountability to many of your stakeholders, whether you are a public company or not. And then the big, the most important aspect is, are you consistent about this matter of uh, stakeholder engagement, such that you don't engage your stakeholders only when there's a crisis or when there's a turn of event. And then normal times, people forget about you because they have not seen you in six months or in one uh, in one year. Then the other aspects is uh, all our businesses have got suppliers. And this aspect where now we start looking at, do you audit your suppliers? Do you conduct assessments to find out where their products are coming from? Do you have a supplier code of conduct? Uh, code of conduct. This, uh, the most important thing about this talk is, is going to put your mind in a place where you start asking yourself, is, no matter my skill of business, can I start developing things like a system of audit and assessing our suppliers and actually developing a code of conduct? Do you also encourage your suppliers to collaborate? 
so that it is cost effective also for them because you can find like there are two suppliers who are almost supplying different things they are not in competition but probably they come in the same area can they collaborate in something to save cost or can one supplier actually teach another supplier remember you are the one in the middle and you are the ones the, the one to uh, orchestrate this and then the issue of the responsible sourcing where your products come from is there is there responsibility like is there sustainability especially on aspect of environment and those goods actually been uh, the material you are producing or the goods you are buying from are they being produced in the right manner there is no aspect of gender discrimination or environmental degradation or uh, child labor and then there's aspect of uh, environmental responsibility and sustainable parking and local sourcing. All these are aspects uh, which you can be able probably to see this PowerPoint, which I'll share uh, freely. These are aspects which I want, you can go step by step and start asking yourself, as the owner of the business, what can I do about all these things? Or what can I start doing about them? The sooner you start, the better. Because some of these things might not play, but as your business scales, because for me, I'm very pro, like your business needs to scale. It cannot remain the same. It cannot remain the same. So there's an aspect on supply side. Now, when you go to your product or your service, this aspect relies on longevity. Does your product, when you are designing it, whether it is a service or a, a physical product, is it sustainable? Can it give a long, uh, a longevity? Is there a life, uh, a life cycle assessment? Have you checked what happened for physical products afterwards? Even for services, what happens afterwards? Uh, afterwards, This is where now some of these things can start becoming a serious, serious competitive edge. Because you might find yourself, as you are going to look at what happens afterwards, you might find another unmet business opportunity, which you can be the first one to uh, step in. All these are aspects of the product, things like co-friendly manufacturing, reducing uh, packaging waste, durability and repairability of product. This one has actually become very, very important, such that the way products are made nowadays, we, uh, there's a time when products became like they're not serviceable. But right now, when you look at globally, we're going back to the right to repair things. Uh, I don't need to buy a phone today and then it gets spoiled and then I have to buy another one. It should be there should be that right of repairable so that I don't have to spend a lot of other money which also results in a lot of waste. And then your product labels and certification. Do they speak the truth? Have you gone for higher standards in certification of your product? And then there is ethical labor practices which you've spoken about. And then there's social responsibility on the supply chains. Everyone involved in your supply chain, do you mind about their welfare? beyond the aspect of business. Then there's aspect of reducing uh, waste. Then also, does your product uh, encourage the aspect of circular economy? This is something which has, uh, which is, has really caught on upon. Like, can your product, does your product around, I, I have a cycle where it allows for it to be recycled. Then there's aspect of consumer education. Consumer education because goes beyond the aspect of uh, advertisement, but it indicates your product like this is where you source. When you see this product on your table, this is where we source your product. And probably if your product has got an aspect of the consumption, there's an aspect of waste. You can even start educating your clients. And right now, there are a lot of mediums which have come out there from social media. You can take an aspect uh, uh, of this. Then the employee and uh, training and engagement and all these other things from regulatory compliance to continuous improvement and also supplier audit and accountability. And this one is dealing with the aspect of uh, product. Then there is an aspect of finance and investment in your business. Have you defined the ethical and sustainability guidelines, especially on the aspect of finance, where you get your money to finance your business? Have you defined where you are going to get your money? People are going to finance your business. Who are they? Have you defined the kind of people you are going to get money from and the kind of people you will not go pursuing money from? Because money out there is available from different sources. You need to have this defined uh, defined in it sustainability reporting is do from your financial uh, how you handle your finances do make uh, do make provisions for sustainability reporting how you use your finances uh, your financial uh, management in your business does it show an aspect especially of sustainability towards the environment but also towards the business do you engage with ethical investors 
that is self-explanatory. And when there is investment to be made in your company, is there screening uh, screening uh, done towards that investment? Where is the source and where is it coming from? And then there's the aspect of uh, how uh, do you do look forward towards collaborating with ethical institution and then the stakeholder uh, stakeholder communication. There is an aspect also which I want just to bring into view. All these others are still in the aspect of finance, like there's transparency and, uh, and accountability, regular reporting, financial education, especially for uh, the first place I'll start is especially for your employees, so that when changes happen in your company, especially right now when there are a lot of difficulties, is people can understand why we are taking this kind of thing. You can quickly explain for me your financial records, uh, financial records, and people actually understand where you are coming from. And then there's an evolution about sustainability finance. There are some sources of finance which have come in. Uh, come in. Are you engaged with them? And again, an aspect of continuous improvement, which will meet which will meet a lot in this aspect of sustainability and ethics. Finally, there's this aspect of regulatory compliance. Uh, have you established just a code of ethics in your organization? Do you do regular training and education internally for your employees and also with all your other stakeholders, especially your suppliers, uh, your suppliers and any other partner you have? Do you have mechanisms for reporting? Do you have a whistleblower uh, policy where you can be able to get information, uh, information which might be adversarial or which where things are not running well? Do you have a dedicated ethics officer or a committee which looks like are we doing our things ethically and do report? I think you've seen a lot of these things have now started uh, coming out and you've seen even companies are now start to, uh, starting to report. I think you've seen Safaricom almost every year they have a report where they're saying how many people they have fired for fraud. That is reporting. They are showing people actually we fired this number of employees, 60, and it's the aspect of fraud. They might not give you the name but the number, speed. Showing you that the the company is taking an active measure uh, towards how it's dealing with its uh, stakeholders. There's a compliance training, compliance review. This one, do you have an anti-corruption policy which is implemented? Again, I go back to the ethics. Is ethics you need to have made a decision before, not when you are there. When you are there, it can you can easily compromise. But when you have made a decision before, you will see it from far and you not. Uh, and you will not have to struggle making a decision. And then finally, there is the aspect of risk assessments. Uh, do you have a board? Does a board actually take the aspect of ethics, uh, ethics uh, reporting, ethics compliance, ethic um, uh, implement, uh, implementation of ethics in all our conducts uh, there? Do you also welcome external uh, audits and certification? Apart from the finance one, do you do welcome people who are in a... Um, especially in other audits which are dealing with the aspect of sustainability and ethics, to just uh, audit your firm. So finally, there's the aspect of uh, all this. These are some of the challenges you might meet as you try to implement some of the sustainability aspects and ethics. There is, can be huge resistance to change. Expect that. And then also it can be a costly, there are some costs and investment which might be involved. And then also you might find yourself like, Probably you are at a position where you, are, you lack awareness. The good thing, there are resources. There are also professional service providers who can help you adapt uh, this, AKA strategy being, AKA consulting being uh, one of them. Then complexity of supply chains, especially people in manufacturing who are dealing with very, very, uh, very many uh, suppliers. Is sometimes that complexity might make uh, actually implementing some of these things uh, put, uh, a little bit uh, challenge. And then there's an aspect of compliance and regulation. It's a moving goal. Sometimes there are new regulations coming in, others moving out, others being adjusted. And then also for a company, and this is the one which faces a lot of entrepreneurs, there's usually a competition between short term and long term. Sustainability, uh, sustainability aspect is usually a long term goal, but there are short term things you need to make a profit this quarter. So there's also there's usually that aspect, and then there's also skepticism, consumer skepticism, and I think you have seen it in some of the companies. Even as much as they try to come for to come uh, forthcomingly, we are doing this thing. People still approach them with suspicion. We don't think we are uh, uh, we can trust you. Or there's just some aspect of uh, skepticism. I think every one of us here usually they wonder when uh, 
you know when you receive an email and KRA is telling you happy birthday, you're wondering, eh, I don't think they should have done that. <laughs> eh, or they are wishing you a happy new year. Eh, it is usually met with a, like there's some skepticism or what do they want? I've already paid my taxes. And then there's also supply chain distribution, something we show a lot, especially during the aspect uh, the time of, of, the, of the COVID pandemic. And then there's aspect also of the competitive pressure. Like you in a very competitive uh, industry, sometimes you might find implementing some of these things uh, hard. So these are also other challenges. There's resource constraints, transparency concerns, complexity of reporting, supply chain audit. All these are the challenges which you be able you as you try to actually implement some of this aspect, you might meet with them. Uh, meet uh, with them. Then future trends also there are some future trends coming here. I think the aspect of circular economy is coming up, but also aspect of carbon and net zero commitment is coming a lot. Then there also the aspect of uh, uh, stakeholder engagement. I'm thinking the ones which are serious. There's also biodiversity uh, conservation. These aspects are very much in front of us, and they are growing in their momentum. So in the future, whether you're a small company or not, uh, they are going to be also be applying. Uh, to you, I think some of you is have seen like when you when you apply for tenders or to do businesses with larger organization, being seen as so many many other policies. This can be a good place to actually start developing those policies, such that by the time when you apply for to do businesses with larger organization, especially the multinationals and uh, multinational corporations, is you have got all these things ready, and even you have evidence of. Like you monitor, you've got even a committee who can even produce a, a, a report. This one is usually a huge problem for small businesses because they can produce policies, but sometimes uh, during the vetting, they are asked, okay, can you show us an evidence like you would actively monitor this? And that's when it's, it usually comes out clear. These people have got a policy, it's probably they made it because of this uh, tender they were applying. So these are all the other aspects of future trend. The thing about this the PowerPoint, I'm going to leave with it. Finally, about this aspect, especially of ethics, is uh, uh, I'd just like to leave with this quote uh, by Kerry Stokes uh, over here, where uh, he speaks about ethics is actually just simple honesty, in which all the society, the whole society is based. And actually, when you look at the level of honesty in society, you can see a very huge uh, difference. Also, I'd like just to share with the other things, like without ethics, which is a prime thing about these things as we try to make a decision where our moral principle is man has no future. Uh, has no future. This is like mankind without ethics, they cannot uh, survive. So finally, this is a bonus which I usually give every presentation. Whether that I, even if I'm just into, uh, invited to speak about it, an aspect of tax is my very uh, AK advisory looks forward about your business growing. And there are three things we look at building at your business. First of all is, do you have bankable profits? Bankable profits is, from every profit you make, do you put sparingly some amount aside? And do you build such a fund? This is very, very important. Because this is the money which we shall use to expand. This is not your profit. You've already taken your measure as a profit as a, uh, as a thing. And even the Bible has got something about this. When you look at the story of Joseph in Egypt, when you're putting a percent, the 20% uh, of the grain in the, uh, when it was gi given that job by the Pharaoh, it is very, very important. Does your business have bankable profit? And is it growing? This is a money which will give you a lot of things that I'll show how the intersection plays. Then leverage sales. Is your company able to make sales even when you are in this uh, webinar? Uh, have you automated, uh, have you made things in your company such that it can continue making sales even when you are not there? You don't need to have a physical uh, presence uh, about it. And then finally, there's aspect of transferable value. Can people see value in your company such that they want either a piece of it or the whole of it? Coop, uh, the, uh, Coop Bank had uh, bankable profits. The bankable profits which enabled it to acquire Kingdom Bank. That is bankable profit. And they saw transferable value in the glad Kingdom Bank when they went to buy it. In your business, are people asking you to buy a share 
on it. That are the things which you offer. So when you have bankable profit and leverage sales, you have got momentum. If you have got bankable profit and transferable, you have the options. You cannot take a loan. You are not scared if you are going to default or not. You have money. You are taking a loan from a bank, but you are not uh, scared about it. And then the, when you have leverage skill and transferable value, is your scalability so on all this coincide is your business is able to impact that is what actually as ak advisory we surely focus so this is me these are my contacts Benedict karaoke is my name you can get these contacts uh, talk to us if there's an issue uh, that, like an issue you might want uh, especially to implement in regards to this these are our services. Uh, we are into the space of entrepreneurship, capacity development, strategic planning and implementation support. And especially this one is very important where we help businesses identify the opportunity that is there. Because sometimes you can be happy about your business, but you don't know the size of the opportunity which is out there. We are very much on providing financial advisory and guidance on financing options. All businesses, most of them are looking for money to scale. Uh, to scale or to do something else. Then also we help our client, especially during the strategic planning, but also another aspect is on the aspect of risk management. What are some of the risks? Have you developed mitigation measures about it? Uh, about it, and then also uh, as uh, somebody introduced me, I still uh, uh, indulge in human resource advisory and equipment, recognizing like people are your most important assets in your enterprise. And then finally, there's coaching support. This one is just for reinforcing and growing. Uh, new habits so maybe i like to stop there uh, for questions and uh, i think i'll add it over to sam um benedict um sam seems to have dropped off but okay. um if you, yeah, yeah if you could please take us back to the venn diagram hmm? back to your venn diagram Oh, this one. Yeah. Um, yes, that one. And give us a little bit more um, on that. Okay. Uh, this one was a bonus. I do not want to look as if I'm going towards again. Let me start with transferable value. Right now, if I came to buy your business, is do, uh, many businesses, if you have to buy them, you have to buy even the owner. Because if the owner is not there, there is no value. Is there a way your business is structured such that if you left or you step aside, like the business has value even when you are not there? That is the aspect of, that's how you measure transferable value. Like is the value of your business invested in the entrepreneur themselves or is there a separation between the owner and the business? That's how we start seeing uh, the value of a business. For example, uh, right now, I think the most valuable company is Safaricom. Uh, Safari home, you can see its value. And that value is not dependent on the CEO or the management team. Whether it changes or not, it does not affect. If you want all of them to be removed, the value remains. That is the aspect of transferable value. Are you every day in your actions? And this is something which when you start your businesses, look forward because businesses you'll have at one time to sell them. I usually say like, in your business is how will you exit? Will you exit horizontally? Horizontally is death, or you will live vertically when you are still walking. Uh, walking. Your business should have transferable value such that people are asking to buy a shareholding, a, share, a part of it, or not. Leveraged sale. The other, uh, the other uh, circle is: Can your business be able to sell when you are not there? This one can be about the aspect of automation of automation or you've even put a model and again go back to safaricom is all the mpesa agents are not safaricom employees but they're able to they help safaricom run the mpesa enterprise throughout the country have you put your businesses have you put your business do look at your business in such a way that it can leverage sale without uh, you being there uh, you as the business owner being uh, there then the aspect of bankable profit is for every profit you make, after you've paid yourself, you've done everything, put part of your profit for building, uh, for uh, for future purposes, and accumulate this fund. This is the fund which you will first of all use to expand, but most important is you can use to buy companies. And the example I gave here is uh, Coop Bank. Coop Bank, when it bought uh, Kingdom Bank, uh, uh, Kingdom Bank, 
it did that from its bankable profits. So bankable profits, you don't touch, you put them aside, you accumulate. But also it helps you also when you operate on this Venn diagram. You're able to look at the other businesses and you see, actually this person's business, he has got leverage sales, bankable profit, but does not have transferable value. Using your bankable profit, you can buy them out. And you build their transferable uh, value. Uh, transferable value. So in the intersection of this, this is it makes your business to be scalable. If you're able to do these three things perfectly, you're able to scale them and take them to your next business. Or even if, or you have to start your next business, your next other uh, business is you're going to take these practices where if you've not done these three things properly, those mistakes you'll repeat them in your second, third, and fourth business. Something which I've seen a lot of businesses from experience like they go repeating this aspect it's a simple diagram but uh, every day as a business owner how can you help your sales be leveraged so that your sales happen whether you are there or not whether your shop is open or not your sales are happening transferable value how can you make your company so valuable that if you are like people even before you talk they are just coming to knock your door we want to enter kenya and go to buy a part of you or the whole of you and then the aspect of bankable profit i don't know if it is clear now fiona i think it, it came through peter waweru is asking peter waweru you have a question in the chat you said explain please uh clarify the question you'd like to explain because i think we have gotten quite a bit of content from uh benedict um, Benedict, um, I'm very tempted to ask, but no, let me go ahead and actually ask that question. So at this point, we are in, uh, I really like this Venn diagram, and also like how you're linking it to the connection of sustainability and ethics. But I'm very curious. So we have many entrepreneurs here. I imagine that some of us here are like, Benedict, I, 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 it's just, this is too complicated. Aki, you're talking of future trends of the competitive advantage i'm just trying to make some revenue do the best i can now when you get into aki green what it's just it's complicated i just want to do my business and make a profit what is the danger of not paying attention to this in terms of sustainability especially for those of us who are especially micro and medium size and also small I think the biggest uh, aspect which affects uh, small businesses, especially the ones which want to, uh, they are small or micro in nature, is your employee turnover. You have got all this upheaval of employees coming in and leaving out. There is a lot of instability. Why I have mentioned employees throughout this uh, presentation is because for you as a small business, maybe you don't have very complex supply chains, uh, or even your financing does not need uh, does not have a lot of complexity from who is investing in your business. But at a certain point, will require employees. How do you treat them? I think that's the first place you should look like. Can you have employees which, as your organization grows, they can grow with you and pick up huge responsibilities? They are happy actually working at your organization. I think you saw from the employee engagement survey, which was produced uh, this year, it shows like almost like 75% of employees all over the world, they are disengaged. People come to work and they are still looking outside there for greener pasture. So for small businesses, is and, uh, I think the first place we can look is how do you treat your employees? Then it can now flow to customers. Because you cannot treat your customers very well when you don't have uh, happy employees. So I think that is a, the main challenge I will give. And you can use it as a competitive edge. You can be a very small business where you have employed two people. But those people actually take your word out there. Like, this guy is a small, my employer is a small business. But how he treats us, uh, how he treats us, it's a good organization. I can refer people to apply there, uh, there, uh, they apply there. So I think that's the aspect where I like to focus for small uh, businesses. Because also, I recognize, like, they might not have a large uh, carbon footprint, like the emissions and all that stuff, probably they don't have. Yeah. But... Yes. Yeah. I like that. So yeah, and the reason I asked that question is because sometimes as especially small, my especially micro and small, we tend to think, you know what, right now I'm still at this level. When we get there, we will think about it. But I like your perspective of any business you have, you will have employees. And if you have employees, I imagine you want to grow 
from 2 to 5 to 10 to 20 to 100 and increase. And as long as you think of growth, you have to think of sustainability. And these are some of the conversations. Um, would you comment on, um, I know there's a question that has come through in the in the, in the the chat. Peter Iwawere is asking, what's, there's some bits you missed out there. So you did the big ones, but what's momentum, scalable, optionality? Would you touch a bit on them? And at this point, maybe before you do that, I want to let everyone know this is our Q&A section. So if you do have a question, you can go ahead, put it in the chat or in the Q&A so we can have our expert for the day respond to that. Um, let me give you a few minutes. If you could take, uh, I guess, briefly, if you can, just touch on what's the momentum, scalability, and also uh, optionality. Optionality. Okay, so uh, uh, momentum comes when uh, you started building leverage sales. You have defined the leverage sales. Are you able to sell even when the shop is closed? Or you as the owner are not there? Uh, is not at the business. And it, it is the intersection also you have enough money. So what happens is your business starts having momentum. Uh, if you remember physics, like she has to go to the momentum now to, uh, to do more, to do more and actually sell even more. One is uh, you can add your stock or your stock, like let's say you are selling physical products. If your inventory levels are probably something like 2 million, now you have got momentum even to put it at 10 million. That is the momentum you are talking with. It also goes a momentum where you can... Uh, probably be able to, like when you look at your performance, you can see like how much you're able to move in a day has actually increased. That is the momentum I'm speaking from. And this one comes from like, you're able to make sales even when your shop is closed or you as the owner is not present, is not at the business, and you have got enough money to put in systems. Uh, system. Like one of the things is when you have got bankable profit, this is where you can use actually that money to automate your sales. Uh, to automate uh, your sales. For example, like banks have leveraged their loan savings from all this. Like you can apply their loans, uh, their loans using up the banking app. That is a serious leverage for them because they don't need staff to sell loans. All they need to tell their customers is we have got profit and they give them momentum to even put more loans into hands of their customers. That is a serious, serious uh, automation. And that's why you've seen it's a very huge contented space where even the telecoms are trying to get into and every other aspect. Optionality is again, I'll start at the bankable profits. You have money. You have enough money. And also you've got a value which is a value which other people can see. Transferable value is not the value which you see yourself as the business owner, but it's value which other people can see. I can see the value in a Coop Bank. A, in Coop Bank. Very clearly. I can see from their financials to their size. I can see there's some value there. There's some value uh, out there. So what uh, optionality is uh, when you have got the uh, bankable profits, again, I repeat, the money is you have got options. You are very comfortable taking a loan. You don't even need to take a loan for a certain aspect or a project you're implementing, but you have the option of just taking it because you're not bothered about if you are going to default. But you're saying instead of touching my bankable profits, I think I can still take this loan. It gives you that optionality among many other options that you have for your business. You can go after a business. You can look like, I think in my business, uh, my competitor might be struggling in this. Or even, uh, like you can see, for example, is, let me give you a good example. Is, uh, what happened to Yaya Center? Yaya Center had value, like serious, serious value. And you can see, I think uh, months, two months ago, it was bought from uh, the previous owner, the Bewood family, it was sold. Like, it had value. Like, I'm sure, in fact, when I saw that transaction, the newspaper was like, these are some of the transactions you should be there in. Uh, you should form that consortium buying that. It had value. And the people who came to buy it had money. Had money and connections. Some of them uh, in that consortium is not only do they have bankable profits, but also the own banks, which had to lend them so that they are able to buy the aspect value. So it gives you a, a, an optionality like, I might not be in this business, but I see a value in another business, I can go and buy it. Scalability. Scalability is now when you have leveraged sale and you have got value. It is very easy to spread uh, out there. Just I'll take the example of like M-Pesa. The way M-Pesa, the relationship they have 
with the Mpesa vendors, Safaricom with the Mpesa vendors. Is they able to be paid by the commission from the transaction which arrives there? But they're able to scale in every part of the country without Safaricom having to invest uh, invest in terms of physical infrastructure or human resource uh, capital. I hope, uh, is it Dr. Waweru or Mr. Waweru? I hope uh, I've been able to explain those three aspects of momentum, scalability, and optionality. Thank um, I felt that we've spent quite a bit of time talking about sustainability. I'm curious to pick your mind on, especially as, again, most of us here are small, so micro, small, and some of us are media. There's pressure on the ethics side of things. Ethics essentially is, is it right, is it wrong, and how do we make those decisions? And that's also part of our conversation today. There's pressure under the economy conditions that we are in, the dollar, this and that affecting us. Um, there's the temptation to, you know, get some creative accounting to sometimes corruption tendencies come in. We book books to seem like, to make our businesses seem like they are appearing a certain way. Also that we, you know, we're trying to get the profit in. What's the danger in it and how does that relate to us? How does that affect our sustainability in the long run? I think the first one is very obvious. Somebody who cooks books or takes shortcuts is, I wonder if they, they sleep well at night. Because uh, everything when they hear Kerry is making a movement, uh, a movement somewhere, they're usually scared. So the first thing is peace of mind. Okay. Like uh, there is that peace of mind that should any government regulation or should any person want to come and know about my business, I have nothing to hide. It is very comforting. It might not look as value, but it has value in very many places. Like you as the business owner, you are open. When inspectors or any other person steps in your business, you can open. You are not scared like one day you might get into conflict with your employee and then your employee goes and reports you somewhere you've been doing X, Y, Z. I think the most important thing as your business owner is it gives you peace. One of the things I, I started with that question is like you you made your you you started your business to create wealth. You can create that wealth conveniently without it affecting your health or uh, uh, your health or also peace of mind. If we take insurance, because insurance, why people buy insurance is it's for peace of mind. You know, if such an accident happened, I'm covered. The same thing about ethics is ethics, they'll help you just have that peace of mind, which is important. Yes, there might be losses for opportunities, but there's that peace of mind. And then also we are living in a very competitive environment. I think you've heard about all these things about uh, Kenya is a signatory of uh, African continental free trade area. Uh, the president the other day signed the economic partnership agreement with uh, a economic partnership agreement should those things come into place and say first of all the first thing we are seeing is like when they come into full infection is what they will do is they'll open some of the sectors and competition also companies which are outside this continent probably from europe now that's where the aspect of a uh, of ethics and compliance comes into place is you don't want to start learning ethics and compliance when all these competitors are there. This is a muscle you should develop it long before. Uh, long uh, before. Because all these agreements being signed, is, they are advantage for us. They expand our market, but also they open, uh, uh, they open competition from us. If you are competing with people who have got high ethics, uh, uh, with high ethical standards, is they will always be preferred. There are also other aspects which are coming into place. Uh, I've been in the preview of some of the contracts which uh, very large organizations uh, very large organizations have been like uh, governments have been giving government to government grants. Now I think because of a lot of uh, problems in the government sector because of corruption they are starting to offload some of this work to private entities. And I have seen those private entities that have been tasked with this. They are given these things because of one thing. They are honest. They can be trusted. Integrity. Yeah, integrity. Yeah. Like integrity has opened. And some of them, even they are shocked. I know of clients who have been given contracts, which as they're implementing it, their, their auditor is behind their back and telling them, you guys, you are not spending money. You need to spend money. This is money from a foreign government. It's to be spent. If you are going to double or triple people's salary, People it. 
you want this money as you're effective, spend it. That is uh, some of the fruits which come with that aspect of ethical compliance, ethical practice. Yeah. I like that. So just maybe to, to re-echo what you said, ethics is very critical and it's sort of the foundation. If you're going to cut corners at the foundation, then you can't wait when you're 20 stories up to reconsider the foundation. So it's best to start, uh, decide that the right thing is the right thing. So from peace of mind and all the other benefits that come in the future. Okay, so um, let me just check if there's any other question. Maybe we'll take one or two more. I know some people have been asking for the recording. In a short while, I'm going to show you how you can access this recording. And for those also who have been asking for Benedict's contact, we are going to share that. We already asked and he's generous with that. So you can pick up on that and uh, and, and reach out to him so he can perhaps provide that information. Maybe, maybe that's where we should go. So there's a lot that you've shared with us in terms of enhancing regulatory compliance, sustainability and ethics. I want to pick up on one of the things that you mentioned and uh, when you say resistance to change. So if I'm starting to think like this, like Benedict was just shared, but then in my organization, there's a lot of resistance to change and it's also high cost because it's easier to look the other way. But to say, no, I want to invest in this for the long term. How do you, how do you, work with those challenges when there's resistance to change and you're saying, no, we need to do the right thing for a long-term growth, but there's challenges. How do you normally help SMEs who are going through those challenges, Benedict? Uh, much of that usually deal with the management, especially the owner, because uh, resistance to change can actually be tackled very easily if the owner is the one who actually change begins with themselves. Because in a company is, a, and this is an aspect which touches, touches a lot of the company culture. Uh, a lot of definitions have been given for the company culture, but company culture is what the business owner or the head does, consciously or unconsciously. If he keeps time, like that, <laughs> people will start keeping time automatically. They'll see like their boss in the office. What the boss says <laughs> and do, they comply. People will just line up because you cannot ask for things they are not seeing from you. Uh, from you. So the best way as a small business is uh, and you are trying to fight any resistance to change, not only on this aspect of sustainability is do people see yeah. you doing stuff? If it is, uh, especially on most companies they have got all this aspect of like what you spend, you need to bring it to the finance office. Uh, the receipt, yeah. everything so that you have is start you as the business owner, even if it is your money do it. When they hear it the right. boss uh, the boss travels and never wastes time. If he travels over the weekend to do something on Monday, before lunchtime, before 12, p uh, 12 uh, p.m., he has given his receipt. Slowly everyone, uh, slowly, everyone will start doing because what the finance person will tell them, can you imagine the owner submits all these reports? Yeah. Whether they are what, are what, what he sits there, who are you not? <laughs> you make it easy. Okay. something which, yes. And the same thing applicable in your house. Your children do what they see you doing. And even, uh, okay. I like this conversation because it was more of a built call. Even Jesus was saying, the things I do, I see my father doing. So yes. the same thing in the so business is, the employees do yes, things. <laughs> they see, they see the, the owner doing. Uh, the owner Compliance. doing. Or the, uh, the top <laughs> management doing. So that's how you can fight all these things about resistance to change. Okay. Okay, very good. Well, thank you so much. Um, you know what? Our time is fast spent. Let me just check if there's any other question. I know that um uh, let's see. Um Christine, Christine Mirigo, Mirico, you had a question, but I can't seem to find it. If you can put it in the chat very quickly, we'll be able to attend to it. But again, I mentioned we are going to be sharing this recording and I'll be showing you how you can access it. Let me bring maybe as I wait for Christine's question, maybe I'll bring it to a close. For those who are looking for um, Mr. Benedict's contact, he's been generous to share. So he's founder and strategy consultant, aka advisory. Today we've been looking at ethics and sustainability, especially for our businesses. Whether you're micro, whether you're small or medium, we need to be thinking long term. And if you are intending to grow, you need to think sustainability. And also there's also lines of ethics that need to guide your decision making. Um, Benedict, do you have any parting shots that you want to share with us? Um, I know that you speak from many, many sides. So I'm curious if you want to take uh, parting shots and then we'll move to the last bit. 
I think I've seen the question from Christine. His uh, question was, uh, as an SME, we are usually hit by all these bureaucl uh, bureaucratic policy requirements. We don't get any yeah. tax relief or cushion from the government. How do we go around this? Okay. Now, seriously, yeah. Christine, this has been an upheaval, especially with all these requirements that have come with the current finance bill and very many other things. I can see your upheaval. It is there. First of all, something gets yeah. implemented, and then that's when you go back and uh, formulation aspects of how you are going to do uh, toward it. I can feel it. The thing is, which I can uh, probably do is this is where you look for uh, help from professional services. If you can't afford them, is you have friends who probably can help you uh, in this uh, aspect just to implement uh, some of the things. The thing about uh, tax reliefs and uh, cushions from the government, this one is a war which we'll have to fight because uh, the body responsible for helping us with this, the parliament, is is not helpful towards business. In fact, the, uh, when I look about this year, I have never seen such a year where almost everything looks very hostile towards either business owners or anyone who is employed uh, employed uh, over there. So it is something which probably we need to look at, but something which I can say it so begins from our politics, especially what happens with our legislation, uh, with our legislation. Because as much as the government wants to tax a lot of businesses, it's not very fast creating an enabling environment, uh, envi enabling environment uh, from uh, from it. So, Christine, probably this is something which probably we can take uh, aside with you. It's something which I like to talk to you. Probably is you have my contacts. Uh, for you, I'll give you a free session. Like this one, call me. Uh, I've marked your name. Is. Let's talk about. Let's let, let's sit think, around this because I, I want to see. You. I, I want to. See I see you. this is a. Uh, yes. <laughs> I see this okay. is a a very passion point. Maybe, maybe if I can give you twenty other seconds, um, John, Junior Fred also. So that the challenges. No, before before parting shots, um, no. the Junior Fred also mentions taxes. It's uh, KRA has some very ambitious targets, and also some systems may not be working for us. What can we do? Can, do you have like some pointers at least? Some you know, where do we start? Just give me some pointers for everyone, even as Christine prepares for her personal session. Uh, first of all, is. Uh... I think there are a lot of webinars being offered, especially on different aspects of matter. Those are things you can educate yourself uh, into, uh, into. I like like a lot of people so usually like from webinars like this, they're even starting to upload them uh, in the, uh, uh, on YouTube so that you can go and educate yourself. My advice for me is that an entrepreneur take time also to renew, to, to, read, to, to read stuff, to interact with stuff so that you, you learn you learn about it. Create time like where I'll be taking time at this to go and teach myself something. Don't leave it to other people first. Uh, leave it to them after you have understood so that when they have done, you can now come and see if they have done it correctly. Take time to educate yourself Go because tax will not tell you to go and read. Look for uh, webinars, uh, webinars which are there are also recordings. There are people who are very well, very much uh, they are very generous with what they have shared. Uh, uh, which can be helpful for your for your businesses. So that's what uh, probably can take you. Take time also to read all these things about leverage sale, bankable profits, and all of that. Is there are things you can take time there to read. Read for your business. Uh, that is something which I like to spare with you. Uh, like uh, urge every entrepreneur like take time to learn something. Even if it's not related to your business, at a certain point it will come somewhere and converge. Just as I was given this uh, talk of what is the intersection of sustainability yeah. and ethics. So it's important to educate yourself and don't leave it to others. Don't delegate your education. Benedict, you have parting shots for us. My short is for every person in business. Like business can be done uh, with convenience, and you don't need to earn your wealth in the hard way. There is a convenience <laughs> and a faster way, a faster yes. way of doing. Another aspect, uh, convenient and faster way. Oh, leveraged sales. What Uber did is leveraged sales. They don't have vehicles, but somehow they leveraged something in the transport industry. Okay. And, uh, yeah. and that is what you call innovation. If you're able to leverage your sales, that is an innovation. So for me, business can be done. You can earn your health in, a week, in an easy 
convenient way and a faster is also aspect of it. Very good. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Benedict Kariuki, founder and a strategy consultant at AK Advisory. Please, let's give him a round of applause. Uh, his his uh, contacts on the screen, his email, his number, please reach out. Of course, he offers this as a service. So I think it's Christine who managed to get uh, his generosity. Uh, but if you're reaching out, please uh, just say, hey, we met at this scope thing, but I'm interested to work with your services. And you can perhaps give you this. <laughs> no promises there, but thank you so much, Benedict. For your time um we appreciate you thank you very much it's uh, an honor also to do this with cop bank and also with mi thank you thank you very much. i have known for a very long time <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you thank you very much all right so we have about let's say about five minutes i know i promised to share with you how you can get this recording that we've just had how you can get all the other recordings but also how you can um, benefit further from these sessions. So let me go ahead and do that. But uh, maybe before I do that, allow me to use feedback poll here. We like to use this as a way of just measuring the value that you're getting. We want to get feedback from you. Just um, give us a comment about our guest speaker for the day and also about uh, the interactivity of the session, but also how applicable this content has been for you. This is a way of making sure that you're getting the value that you come for every time when you come for these sessions. So I'll, I'll be quiet for 30 seconds or so. And then after this, I'll share with you how you can access this recording. And uh, and also the slides will also of course be in the recording, but we shall be sure to share that with you as well. Very good, thank you for the quick response. I appreciate that. We like to keep it professional, keep it clear. So we have four minutes to the end of our session and we shouldn't keep you a minute longer from the priorities that you have set for your day. So kindly help me with that. Let's keep it within the time that we have allocated. A few more people left to kindly respond on the chat. Not on, sorry, not on the chat. Using the poll, sorry about that. Using the poll, I see about 40% of us have responded. Kindly respond and let us know how you feel about today's session. This poll is incredibly important to us because this is the way that we are able to provide the value that you look for every week, all right? Now, as that happens, uh, let me go ahead and also share with you this short clip that shows you how you can access the portal, okay? There's a portal with all the webinar sessions that we've had for the last close to a year. So you can go straight to Google, or we can just use the link that's been shared in the chat, and it will take you to straight to this page right here. So it will take you to the Cop Bank website. And all you have to go to is click on not to, uh, Knowledge Hub and Under Knowledge Hub, click on webinars. The moment you click on webinars right there, it will take you to a whole list, a whole repository of all the sessions we have had in the past. And there's so many subjects that we've covered. So I hope that you can maximize that. All right. All right. So that's that. And I believe the link is being shared in the chat. Let me just double check that. Yes, the link is being shared. Fiona, thank you so much. Again, to bring this to a close, we're reminding all those who missed out on this opportunity to go to Vietnam and Malaysia. This is more just to remind you about what you are missing out on, but we are sure that Cobank is going to be preparing lots more trips. So in the future, if by any chance you miss this narrowly, let us know so that we can keep you updated on the next trip that's happening. Otherwise, we'll keep you posted on what has come through of this. And perhaps we can get one or two participants who have traveled to come onto one of these sessions and share what kind of benefit they had in that process. All right. So a bit of a call to action, um, encouraging always, of course, to everyone, encouraging everyone to visit their uh, branches and also identify and discuss their business financing needs with the relationship manager or your branch manager at home. So all of you have a specific core branch that you tend to go to. Please establish a relationship because if you're looking for especially financing, people tend to uh, provide financing for people they know. And if you don't share about what challenges or opportunities you're looking at, it's very difficult to out of the blue say, here's uh, some financing. So come through. Let's have that conversation in the banking hall or even online. There's contact numbers that I will be sharing. Okay. So here's some contact numbers that I'll be sharing. If you want to reach out to 
pop bank using uh, the WhatsApp line. There's a WhatsApp line. There's a contact center number. There's an email. There's quite a number of options. But the whole point is, hey, reach out to us. Should be able to provide the help that you need. And if we don't have the answer, we will be sure to find that answer because we are committed to your success as an SME, right? Thank you very much. Now we are coming to the end of our session. Um, if you have any ideas around how we can improve these sessions for you, you can reach out to Fiona Maena. This is her number on the screen and also her email. And lastly is to say thank you so much for being here. But before we end, I'm going to go ahead and uh, thank you so much for the responses in the poll. Before we end, we like to start with a prayer and we like to end with a prayer. So allow me in this last minute to say a prayer. Type amen and we'll be ready to jump off into our businesses. Father, we thank you so much for the session that we've had. We thank you for our guest speaker, Benedict Kariuki. Thank you for the participation of the 100 and plus people we've had in this session. We thank you for those who will be watching this long after this particular session is done. I pray that it may yield lots of great results. And I pray that you may bless all our endeavors, even as we commit to ethically and sustainably run our businesses. Thinking long term and not short term, help us to get through whatever challenges we have so that we may see greener pastures. We thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' name we have prayed. And everyone type an amen. Uh, type an amen, type an amen. And as soon as you type the amen, then I'll be happy to let you drop off. All right. Okay, very good. Thank you for being here. Uh, God bless you.